Good afternoon and welcome to the U.S. Access Board's virtual event, Designing for Inclusion, Architectural Trends and Social Justice. My name is Bill Botten, and I'm a Senior Accessibility Specialist and the Training Coordinator at the Access Board, and it's my pleasure today to be your host for this event. As many of you know, that the mission of the Access Board is one of equity. We are a federal agency dedicated to accessible design for the purpose in which is to ensure that persons with disabilities are equally able to use and enjoy our built and digital environments. The board issues accessibility guidelines for buildings and facilities, transportation vehicles and systems, information and communication technology, and medical diagnostic equipment under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Architectural Barriers Act, and other laws. The Access Board has an important civil rights mission, but its guidelines and standards alone do not produce accessible environments and spaces. It's compliance with these requirements that results in actual accessibility. So how is compliance determined? By countless decisions and choices made by architects and designers and engineers, construction crews, building managers, employees, and others. New design trends and technologies often raise questions about what accessibility and inclusive design means. Some trends and products pose fresh challenges to accessibility, while others offer inspired solutions that improve usability for everyone. Today, our speaker is gonna walk us through current architectural trends, several related to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and show us how decisions in the way of these trends are executed, provide or deny social justice to people with disabilities. It's my pleasure to introduce you today to today's speaker, public board member and talented architect, Karen Breitmeyer. Karen L. Breitmeyer, FAIA, is the founder and managing principal of Studio Pacifica, an accessibility consulting firm in Seattle, Washington. She is a member of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Architects, and in 2019 was awarded AIA's Whitney M. Young Jr. Award in recognition of her leadership in civil rights for people with disabilities, social sustainability, public policy, and universal design. Karen was also named the 2019 Person of the Year by New Mobility Magazine. She was presidentially appointed to the U.S. Access Board in 2010. We had also expected to have another one of our outstanding public members with us today, Deborah Ryan, head of Deborah A. Ryan and Associates, an accessibility consulting firm in Boston, Massachusetts, was planning to be one of our presenters. And unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, is unable to join us. Karen has graciously agreed to cover all the planned topics, and we are grateful for her flexibility. So here's what we have on our agenda for today's program. Karen is gonna start with some remarks on architecture and social justice, and then walk us through current architectural trends, pointing out ways that they can be in, implemented in an inclusive manner. Then she'll turn to the accessibility of trends that emerged during the pandemic. Throughout today's presentation, I invite you to ask Karen questions in the Q&A feature of Zoom, okay? In the Q&A feature of Zoom is where you pose your questions. And I'll pose your questions to Karen throughout this presentation as time permits, and at the end in our Q&A portion of this event. Before I turn this program over to our speaker, I'd like to note that while Karen is an Access Board member, Today, she is giving you her personal thoughts and opinions from her decades of experience in accessible design. So what she says today should not be construed as the official position of the Access Board or as an endorsement of any organization or service, product or design, solution by the Access Board or any federal agency. At the end of the program, I'll give you the contact information for the Access Board's free technical assistance hotline. And we invite you to contact us with your specific design questions. And with that, it's my privilege to turn over the program to our distinguished presenter, Karen Breitmeyer. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, well, 
As Bill said, my name is Karen Breitmeyer. I'm speaking to you today from my office in Seattle, and I acknowledge that I am a guest on this land, home of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people. For those of you who can't access this video, I am a white woman in my early 60s. I have short cropped brown hair and wear rimless glasses, and today a, a blue sweater to match the Access Board logo. You can't see my power wheelchair or my hearing aid, but they're here too. We're here today to reflect on the benefits of the ADA standards. So to ground our discussion, let's start with a quick look at what was life like prior to the ADA. Well, let's start with most people with disabilities like me back 40 or 50 years ago, we thought we had to adapt to the built environment. It was not gonna to adapt to us. Maybe my first inclination that that did not have to be true was when I started architecture school. You know, that first day I walked into design studio and there was like a sea of tall drafting tables and tall stools. I'm sitting in my wheelchair, I'm looking up at them going, ugh, not a good fit. But my classmates had other ideas. They went out after class, got some supplies, pried the top off that drafting table, and built me a new base. All of a sudden, I was in business. I realized that changing my environment could change my abilities. As architects, we have the power to change the lives of people with disabilities. Our buildings have the power to include or exclude. Architects, you know, we're licensed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So ensuring that all members of our community do not experience barriers to participation in the built environment is well within our grasp. Throughout history, and to some extent even today, people with disabilities are considered different. But even though some of us have different needs, we are people just like everyone else. So here's the truth. We are a really big group of people with different needs. Today, they say 61 million American adults have a disability. That does not include people under the age of 18. That's one in four adults, a number that's expected to increase as the population ages. Fortunately, we are at the beginning of a transformation in terms of thinking about the points of human difference, not as negative or positive, but simply as things are. Today, we're gonna to reflect on new trends in the built environment, including some driven by the pandemic. Designs that may not have been explicitly considered at the writing of the ADA standards. I'm gonna share my thoughts with you about how um, you can look at any design option to ensure that everyone's included, because you know what? Inevitably, new trends always arrive. So let's start our slides. So our first image here is um, social stairs, or some people call them uh, stadium stairs. So on the left, we have a very classic example of something that I see in my neck of the woods. Um, those large steps, they're about 18 inches tall and 18 inches deep. And to the left of them in this image, there's a traditional staircase, you know, with regular seven inch steps and risers. And the big stairs are really intended for folks to gather on and to maybe observe some kind of an uh, performance or speaker down at the base of, in this case, in this lobby. Um, I think the it's probably obvious that this kind of seating uh, excludes folks who can't climb stairs um, or maybe use a mobility device. So if there's a cluster of people in the middle of that, that um, area, you can't join them. I think what's really, um, sad about this is that I see these used all the time in academic settings. Our very buildings are telling our youth 
that it's okay that their friends who use mobility devices have to sit down there over on the side, maybe at that separate table. So that those kids are segregated and not included. So how would we do this in a more accessible manner? Well, first you would consider this assembly seating and you would integrate a wheelchair spaces into your, um, your bench seating. The image on the right, I think is actually a really fun example that shows that same concept, tiered large steps. There happens to be a ramp woven in it and lots of places where at intermediate spaces, you could, a person who uses a, a wheelchair could pull up alongside their friends and join their group. So that's really what we want. We want to show that everybody's included. Next slide, please. So let's talk about all gender toilet rooms. I don't know about your area, but boy, these are a hot topic here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm, this slide reflects lots of different um, signage that's being used now to try to grapple with what you call uh, these restrooms and um, with lots of different pictograms. Um, personally, I'm kind of fine of the one on the bottom right that just says humans, humans are allowed in here. Um, I guess you're not supposed to bring your dog. Uh, and then um, lots of different um, fun images, you know, in, uh, on the top row, there's the one if you had really big pink hair, you could go in. Next slide, please. So while it's not specifically addressed in the standards, uh, we are seeing that the model codes are starting to grapple with this, um, how, how to define um, what's required for an all gender toilet room. Certainly if you have a um, family or single user toilet room, that does not need to be designated by sex. And there is an exception under the 2021 IBC chapter 29 that addresses what to do in a single user toilet room. But I think the biggest question comes up around multi-user toilet rooms. So under that same chapter, there's a new exception, exception six, which talks about the characteristics that you would want to do to provide privacy in all gender toilet rooms. So um, things like um, making sure that, um, that there is uh, privacy around water closets and urinals, um, whether it's uh, whether you're visually separated or actually in a compartment. Next slide, please. Here in Washington State, um, our building code has gotten very specific around the requirements. And I think this is probably a direction that we will be seeing more and more of. Um, I think one key point is that they ask for no reduction in the number of fixtures that would have been provided if you had separate facilities um, and that the minimum number be provided in the all gender restroom. They must have toilets and urinals in toilet compartments. Those compartments must have full height doors and a door enclosing the fixture to ensure privacy. As well, those compartment doors must be securable. In, so you'd like to be able to lock the door. And in a multi-stall toilet room, the door from the multi-stall toilet room shall not be lockable from the inside. So let's go to looking at some examples. Next slide, please. So here's a plan um, uh, of a, a great kind of sort of typical e example that we're seeing. Um, so you can see on the left, there's a floor plan, schematic floor plan that shows that there's no actual door on this toilet room. Now it doesn't mean you can't have it. This just has a privacy barrier and you enter into a space that has 
lavatories. Um, in the bottom uh, left corner, I, I, don't, I don't want you to be confused. That's a janitor's closet, not meant to be a toilet fixture compartment. But all the remainder are fixture compartments. And um, so you'll see that the toilets and a single urinal are included in a compartment. There are two wheelchair accessible compartments. Remember, you would have had to have one for male and one for women. So now you have two in this restroom, one of which has been designed to be a full uh, single user toilet room. That's not required, but it's a great thing to add. And uh, you're not seeing here, but it is included in the built uh, condition, is that one of the compartments must be um, ambulatory accessible due to the count of fixtures. And you can see from the photos that there are full height doors. It's pretty much built with architectural partitions, not toilet compartments. So let's move on to our next slide. Here's a second example, um, a very um, kind of more fun with lots of curves, right? But with very much the same features. Again, there's um, a, only a privacy barrier to enter this toilet room area. And the lavatories are available to all the users along um, a wall. And then there's a series of compartments. Uh, there is um, from right to left, the first compartment is a wheelchair accessible compartment. The next one is a ambulatory accessible compartment. Then we have three kind of uh, unconventionally shaped toilet compartments. And then the one on the left is a full on accessible toilet room with a lavatory inside its, its own compartment. And you can see from the photo that the doors are um, full height, that it's really built as an architectural uh, compartment, not toilet compartments. And the doors are full height with the exception of a small gap for venting. Next slide, please. So I think one of the confusing things is like, what do you do about urinals, right? Um, if you look at the standard, the requirements for urinals are, you know, a 30 inch clearance between uh, privacy panels or 36 if that privacy panel gets to be deeper than 24 inches. Well, if you're gonna put it in a compartment like in an all gender restroom, uh, your compartment is going to typically be about five feet. But if you hold the urinal to only 36 inches wide and five feet deep, you might be able to get a wheelchair user in there, but they're not going to be able to reach behind them and close the door. And they certainly can't turn around and go back out. So you would have noticed that in the previous, in the first example that we looked at, there was only one urinal provided in the compartment. When you do that, you are able to take advantage of the exception that says, if you only have one urinal in a toilet room, it does not need to be accessible. But if you are going to have more than one urinal in your all gender restroom, then I would <clears throat> recommend that your um, urinal compartment be the same size as a wheelchair accessible compartment so that someone could come in using a wheelchair, turn around, lock the door, use the facility, and exit comfortably. Uh, next slide, please. So I get a lot of questions about what's the difference between a compartment and a toilet room? And because we know that the scoping is different, right? So in, if you have a, a cluster of single user toilet rooms that um, are all, you know, in like you can stand in one place and see the doors, like that image on the right, there's a whole series of doors 
into toilet rooms. Then 50% of your toilet rooms are allowed to be accessible. We know that if you build toilet rooms, every toilet room has to have accessible features. But in this case, if you have a cluster, you're allowed to reduce that to 50%. The requirements are different for a, a toilet room with compartments. And, and so looking at the image on the left where you have um, partitions and compartments that go almost all the way to the floor, I would say that the difference between a single user toilet room and a compartment is the presence of lavatories. If there's a lavatory in each of those toilet rooms, they're individual toilet rooms and you do still need to comply with the 50% rule. If you have like the plans that we looked at before, just a few wheelchair accessible stalls and maybe only one that has a lavatory, then I would consider those compartments. Oh, and of course, key is that you have lavatories outside of the, of the toilet room doors or the compartment doors. Well, that's clear as mud, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next slide, please. So here are some other fun things that I've seen in my travels um, that are that are new and different. On the left, we're seeing um, that there are lights installed over uh, toilet compartments. This is this happened. Uh, I saw this at an airport actually. So it was a very large multi-stall toilet room, and if the stall was occupied, the light turned red. And if the light over the stall is green, it's open. And I, they're doing that for parking garages. And now they're doing it for toilets as well. Oh my gosh. But one of my other exciting um, sort of uh, explorations or excuse me, discoveries was the grab bar that you're seeing on the right. And I'm hoping you can see from the shadow that the outside of the grab bar is very traditional round bar, but the inside, the side against the wall is wavy, like, like you know, the sand at the beach. And it is so lovely to grip, really gives you a firm grip. Anyways, that's super fun. And I encourage you to look um, and see what kinds of grab bars are out there. Certainly, you want things that are compliant with length, diameter, and mounting from the wall, but you can still have some uh, interesting innovation there. Look at another slide. Wow, yeah, we're really still on the toilet room thing, right? So today, now we're looking at laboratory trends. One of the things I wanted to bring up is that I think designers expect that all that if you're going to put in something like a lavatory that you're going to put all the lavatories in they're all going to look exactly the same well i think one size does not fit all very well especially not in the disability community but even amongst people of different ages um and so thinking about variety is it is a good option so in this image on the left, we have um, a toilet room that has lavatories set at three different heights. The image is kind of cuts off on the left-hand side, but there's a very low sink appropriate for kids. Then there are four um, lavatories that are, you may be kind of a conventional height. And then one on the very right of the image, that is a set a little bit higher that maybe would support folks who use a power chair and have maybe higher than average knees and so need a little bit more knee clearance. You'll see that the mirrors vary in their placement and height. And of course, I love that the soap dispenser is set on the side, so much easier to reach, and the faucet is automatic. So this is really to encourage you to think outside the box when you're designing your 
your bathroom uh, plans and think about how you can accommodate the variety in our human population. And then the image on the right is, you know, kind of a new trend, and that is everything automatic. Um, in this case, it's automatic soap, automatic water, faucet, and hand dryer all at the same sink. Very, very cool. Okay, next slide, please. Another trend that is that I'm seeing and I'm just so happy about is the idea of providing uh, toilet rooms that have an adult changing table. There's a whole community within the disability community um, that it is not currently well served by um, our standards. And those are um, families, children and adults um, over toddler age that need support in their toileting. And, you know, we, the access board was um, uh, visited by um, organizations uh, encouraging the inclusion of adult changing tables and told stories about um, having to um, put their, you know, teenage children on the floor of a public toilet room, which is not clean, right? Uh, in order to support their toiling behavior. That's, that's just, you know, not great. So um, there's a movement to include at least one, maybe more toilet rooms with adult changing tables uh, available in areas like um, facilities that have large occupancy like airports or shopping malls or sports arenas, places where there are large groups of people and people are gonna stay for a while. Um, it, it really is, it's just um, uh, an important way of including uh, and allowing those individuals and their families to participate more comfortably in society. Features that we would look for on the adult changing table are height adjustability uh, to in, allow um, a transfer perhaps a seated transfer from a wheelchair and then raising the table up in order to support the health of the back of the caregiver. Some uh, of these toilet rooms also provide overhead lifts or hoists in order to, again, make a transfer easier. Uh, anyways, it's just, um, it's very exciting to see that there's um, uh, a lot of support around the issue of including uh, this particular um, feature in our public toilet rooms. Next slide, please. Oh, gosh. Karen, okay. Karen this yes. is Bill. If I could interrupt for just okay. a second. We've been receiving a lot of questions um, okay. around this, this issue. And, and first, let me say that um, I think your microphone might be getting obstructed a little bit or uh, causing some static with paper or something else that might be touching it. I just wanted to inform you of that. Um, if you wouldn't mind, maybe we talk about a couple of the questions that have been coming in um, and see uh, what your response might be to some of these. Um, I think there's been some confusion about isn't a lavatory a toilet or do you mean a wash sink? And that's kind of a confusing issue for some people. Um, can you ask that question again? Yeah, they asked, isn't a lavatory a toilet or do you mean a wash sink? I do. <laughs> A lavatory in architectural terms is a hand wash sink that's found in a toilet room. So there's a difference between a toilet, which some architects call a water closet, and a lavatory, which is really just the place you wash your hands. I think some of the confusion comes in uh, uh, aircraft and airline industry where they call their toilet room a lavatory. And so I think there's maybe some of that cross uh, uh, terminology that gets confusing um, to where people think uh, that terminology might also apply to the built environment. Oh, gosh. Well, I'm coming from an architect perspective. So <laughs> let me um, ask another one here. Do, do you recommend sinks in the larger wheelchair accessible toilet stalls? I think that if you have the option 
to provide a um, at least one um, like sort of sink toilet combination in larger uh, toilet rooms like we've been seeing in the all gender toilet rooms. I think that is a great help to people with disabilities. Some need to be able to um, wash up after uh, doing some of their toileting behaviors. So I think that is, it's a great benefit, yes. I've got another one here. Do all gender restrooms need an architectural partition or can a traditional uh, compartment partition suffice? Uh, in Under um, our code here in Washington state, that you could use a traditional partition as long as it, the, the door and the side panels go um, almost full length to the floor and um, uh, provide privacy. So I'm not exactly sure if that means it absolutely has to go to the ceiling or just very close to the ceiling. What you do need to pay attention to though is if you have a compartment a wheelchair accessible compartment that where you do not have toe clearance underneath the partition, then you are gonna be required to increase the footprint of that uh, toilet compartment in order to comply with the requirements. Great, um, how about another one here? Um, with full height, height stall doors built into walls, does each stall require a fire alarm visual notification device? Uh, does it require what? A visual alarm, a visual fire alarm. You know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I might bounce that back to access board folks. I don't really, I know one would be required in the room, but I'm not really sure about the actual uh, compartments if they had full doors and full walls. Um, I would imagine that that would be something uh, I might need help answering as well. Um, I would I would hope that you would so that if, if there's no way to get that visual cue, uh, that if you're in that smaller room compartment, that you would have the availability to understand that there is an emergency. Yes. Have you ever seen a, a way to actually identify ambulatory compartments so that people know that they're available? I, I think that the most, um, hmm, the, sort of the most obvious clue would be that the door swings out. Uh, typically toilet, traditional toilet stall doors swing in. So an ambulatory compartment typically differs because the door swings out. And so the only two doors that swing out are the wheelchair accessible compartment and the ambulatory compartment. Um, but I've not, I've not seen, um, I've not seen people sign them. I ha I have not either, and that can be very challenging to understand which one um, does provide that opportunity. Um, I, I think that's uh, yeah. something to consider. That it could yeah. make it more inclusive to have people understand that. Um, let's see here. Do you have a best place or, or a, a, an idea to best install an adult changing table within a, a toilet room? Do I have a best? A best location or a place within the restroom to install this adult changing table. So uh, they are typically installed in a single user toilet room. It, not always, but typically. And I would say that that depends on the configuration of the room uh, and how much space you have as to how you would orient it. Um, so there's no like no specific guidance that I'm aware of. Uh, I'll do one more and then we've got to get moving on. And it's, it, it states that the wheelchair accessible stalls in the family restrooms are very attractive to the general public. Do you recommend signage or even policies to ensure that they're used by those that are intended for? Um, I, I am a big fan of um, reminding people why they're there. And so I like, I like the idea of saying, you know, 
please um, be considerate and and leave this uh, to the individuals that um, need it. Uh, I'm not sure that that always works because folks um, who want to use it just do. Um, but I, I, if if there are any great suggestions out there, I'd love to see it because I have waited a lot for, for to get to that one stall. <laughs> So are we ready to go back? That's correct. Oh, and, and Bill, here you show up on my slide. We're gonna talk a little bit about bottle fillers. So um, I think that, you know, bottle fillers became very popular, um, really kind of the eco-conscious community saying like, we shouldn't be buying bottled water. We should carry our own bottles and fill them. And bottle fillers make it so much easier than trying to get your bottle in, into the spout of the drinking fountain. But now with the pandemic, I don't know, are drinking fountains gonna kind of go the way of the dodo bird? Maybe, maybe not. But if you are installing a bottle filler now, first I want to encourage you, you have to put the bottle filler over the lower of your tool height drinking fountain want to be sure that you can get it within reach. The other thing that's critical to know is that a wheelchair user can't reach forward farther than their toes. So the placement of the bottle filler, it can't be recessed into the wall. It needs to be flush mounted. And then the next thing to think about is where's the sensor? or the trigger that starts the water flowing. And in our office, we encourage that to be no higher than 40 inches, just so that it's like in an easy reach. And then lastly, I wanna encourage that if you do have um, surface mounted fixtures like a drinking fountain or a bottle filler, that you ensure that they are protected in such a way that folks in the blindness community don't um, inadvertently uh, run into them. So the second picture from the right shows a dual height drinking fountain with a bottle filler over it and in a nice little niche so that um, it's kind of tucked back and not a protruding object. And then of course we have my colleague Bill um, sitting at a park drinking fountain, and, um, and it also has a bottle filler in the, the top of that tower. So let's move on to our next slide. Point of sale machines, um, you know, your, your cash register or the place that you're going to put your credit card in to pay for something. Oh my goodness, um, nowadays um, everything is sort of self-service and they are um, attaching these things to counters and um, casework. First of all, you know, if you do install something and that is attached permanently, it must comply so that the operable parts are placed within both the vertical and horizontal reach range. Um, and access, communication access is certainly very important. You know, if you have nothing but a flat touch screen, how does someone in the blindness community, uh, you know, engage with that? It's not completely addressed in the standards right now. Next slide, please. But as we continue to look at, like here we're seeing on the second slide about uh, smart environments and self-service transaction machines. We're seeing like the self-service grocery store checkout example on the left, which really is a, a touch screen. And those, I find those things not only are very, very hard for me to reach as a wheelchair user, but they're also confusing. Like where do you put your credit card in and where does the receipt spit out? Um, and like the, um, uh, the image on the right, which is uh, a place where you would slide your card and put your pin number in and stuff. 
how are these really usable by the general public? I, I want to let you know that the board is um, um, planning to um, issue rulemaking to supplement the AD, ADA standards on self-service transaction machines. So stay tuned. We're hoping that there'll be more information coming on this uh, very important issue. Next slide, please. I wanna to touch a little on tactile wayfinding. Um, these two images are from a transit station in, in my city that opened recently. And there's a, a, a very exciting movement afoot to provide um, tactile material on walking surfaces as a guidance for folks in the low vision and blindness community. You'll see on the right-hand image that there is a embedded tile in the floor surface that has kind of um, bars in it, um, two, two or three bars wide that um, run in the direction of travel. And those lead to uh, the ticket vending machine. There's also a kind of a T shape in it so that um, if you get to a certain point, you'll know that you can go, I think it's right to the elevator or a left to the escalator, but it will take you to vertical circulation. Now, those tiles are kind of a low contrast to the surrounding field uh, flooring. On the left is a sort of a, an addition that they've provided. And these are also the same bars running in the direction of travel, but they are safety yellow, very bold in contrast. And those lead to the fare machines. And you can see how <clears throat> the, uh, they're calling them the tactile guide material, which is the gray, light gray, kind of low contrast material intersects uh, with the bright yellow material leading you to uh, a vertical circulation. So um, there isn't specific guidance about this in the standards, but we are seeing uh, transit and <clears throat> other campuses um, experimenting with this kind of tactile guidance. And it certainly is popular in other countries <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'm I'm excited to see that um, as we explore um, trying different uh, materials, that it will um, possibly be something to add later in in our sort of next edition of of standards. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and of course, I can't I can't you know finish without talking about one of the other big trends, at least in my area, and that is scooter and bike litter. We have a lot of ride share going on in our community. And scooters seem to be the hot topic right now. For a long time, it was bikes, uh, where people can um, sort of point to point, pick up a scooter that might be lurking nearby, um, using your smartphone, and um, ride it to a destination and leave it at that destination. So these are dockless and that causes a little bit of challenge because then that means people just leave them everywhere, kind of willy nilly. And that can potentially block or obstruct um, your, the accessible route. Um, it can, um, be a tripping hazard for people uh, in the low vision and blindness community, just generally kind of a pain. I would encourage, if possible, that um, if we're, you're gonna have dockless uh, rideshare vehicles uh, in your area, that there be designated, I don't know, corrals or um, parking spots for them that are included on um, in your community so that folks have a place, they know this area is where it's okay to leave your scooter and not, um, 
and, and not uh, make a tripping hazard. Let's go on to the next slide. Well, this is where um, I was, Deb was gonna take over. So I'm gonna do my best to try to um, channel her. Karen, maybe we should take a few more of our questions right now before we move oh, into sure. the pandemic. Sure. Yeah. And um, um, we were informed in the Q&A section, and that's what I do want to remind you that we are taking questions for Karen throughout this presentation in the Q&A Zoom feature. Um, there was an approved code change in the IBC 2024 to require adult changing tables in single user toilet rooms. And so um, that issue is moving forward in the in the building code, and um, it's one of those issues I'm I'm very personally happy to see as well. Um, a lot of times they're uh, requesting that they be adjustable height, uh, provide power to, um, but uh, they can greatly improve uh, individuals' lives. Uh, another question we got was speaking of the blind community needing access to drinking fountains, are there requirements to have an audible guide to let um, them know the location of such drinking fountains? I've not heard of one. I was going to ask you if you've heard of any such guide. Um, maybe a tactile building guide would be something that would be uh, recommended to identify certain elements or features of a building. Um, Karen, you have any other ideas? I think, I think that is a great idea. Um, I've actually not had any any questions about that before, but I know that um, um, my colleagues in the blindness community encourage um, buildings that are open to the public to have a, you might call it a know before you go document uh, that might describe what features are available in the building, like where you might find the check-in desk or toilet rooms or other things like that. And I certainly could see adding uh, some information about where drinking fountains are located in that same sort of document. Just I agree. I, I think the more information that you can provide about your facility and location of those features would be very important. Um, what about a pet water bowl? Have you seen those also? And they were talking about the one where I'm sitting at in the park uh, setting where there's a bottle filler and um, also uh, the high and low drinking fountain. Have you seen them also attached to a pet bowl? I, I have actually. Um, I've seen, well, I've seen combination drinking fountains with pet bowls, but not a combination drinking fountain bottle filler pet bowl. So maybe we haven't, maybe they haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, I would, I would just suggest that the operable parts for such an element, you would want to make sure within the reach range and provide a clear floor space at the element. Uh, let's go with one more quick question and then get moved on. We don't want to cut you short on your presentation. Um, how about any design uh, uh, guides or uh, maybe advice you could provide us on when you're designing a, an area or a counter that is going to include self-service uh, point of sale machines? So how to do that like better? Um, I would well, think of all, some of the considerations you would use for well, its placement. I, I would, yeah, I think the, 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 the biggest challenge is the design of the counter that the device is mounted on. So if, if we go back to the access boards animations on self-service, I mean, on, um, on service counters, um, I encourage a service counter that has knee space, knee and toe space for a forward approach. And then you can mount your POS device or your um, card reader um, so that people, it can be closer and down lower um, for um, an easier use. I think when they mount those up at the, you know, top of like 42 inches and, the, and then I can't read the screen, and while I might technically be able to reach, I, I can't tell when it, you know, when the device is telling me, uh, put your pin in or take your card out. So, um, so I really feel like it's a, a good start is the start of the design of the service counter itself. Great. Thank you. Let's go back to your presentation. 
Okay, let's see, where are we? Great, next slide, please. So I know Deb wanted to talk a lot about um, high top seating. And, and it's something that I see and personally struggle with every day. And that is the proliferation of restaurants that have nothing but high top seating, or maybe just one or two standard height tables kind of around the corner. Um, you can see the picture that she included of me in the middle. Um, that's me at a high top table and certainly not a place that either I would eat or feel comfortable putting a hot drink because it might spill on me. I'm not even sure, you know, where is the top of the table? Um, I'll just, um, I'll share that I have personally experienced visiting restaurants where I walk in and and it appears that there are all high top tables. And then the maitre d' says, oh no, wait, I've got one that I can lower. And then they're like digging around, looking under their customer's knees for the table that's adjustable, asking that couple to move, like adjusting the table, lowering it so that I can sit at this table and moving that other couple to another table. Oh my goodness. Um, talk about feeling like, sort of segregated and isolated and definitely called out. It was not a comfortable experience. So um, we just want to think, you know, when you look into, <clears throat> when you walk into places like this, you think, so who does this design exclude? And it might be me. Um, and, and another example of thinking, who does this design exclude is, you know, the standards tell us that if you build a bar, you must have um, a wheelchair accessible seating at the bar. Uh, in this case, it was a small bar, so only one seat was required. Well, you know, how, how inclusive does that feel when you, you go to a bar and you're sitting down here and everybody else is sitting up here? It just makes you feel like isolated. So think about maybe this is your opportunity to do better and to maybe have a couple or three or four seats that are lower at the bar and really make it a place that people feel um, included. Next slide, please. So what makes an accessible dining surface? Well, the table on the left-hand image is a pedestal table, but has two pedestal legs set far apart. So you could kind of imagine that you might be able to get a wheelchair user on one side of that table. But then they added the umbrella base, which totally fills up the, the needed knee and toe space. So that table is not accessible anymore. And then on the right is a very standard, we, what we call in the industry, four top. That means four people can sit at this table, and it has an X base pedestal, which also might, is not accessible because it, the legs of the pedestal base obstruct the knee and toe space for wheelchair users. So what makes a better accessible dining table? Let's go to the next slide. So I just want to remind you, I have the graphic from uh, one of the animations on the left, just showing that you need enough space for both somebody's knees, 27 inches high and 17 inches deep of the, for their toes to be able to get in and 30 inches wide. So this is kind of a, you know, a block that you're trying to get under the table. So what's the best way to do that? Well, certainly a table with four vertical legs. That's the best way. And you can see the two center images, um, one square, one round, are really welcoming and easy for someone who uses a wheelchair to sit at. The image on the right is a large communal table. And that certainly would have multiple places where a wheelchair user could slide in and have the knee and toe space that they need. All right, next slide, please. 
So as we um, as we are uh, moving towards or experiencing an, a surge in outdoor dining, uh, partially due to the pandemic, uh, we wanted to look at how some routes to outdoor dining have been established and whether or not they make you know, good choices or um, leave room for opportunity. You'll see here on the left uh, that that's a sort of an infill ramp that looks as though it might be a little steep and might be a little narrow. And that would be kind of a little bit um, uncomfortable for, for example, someone like me who drives a very heavy power chair to go up and over that. On the right, we have a gravel area, which if it had some sort of a binder, uh, it might be something that you could navigate, but then they added pavers. So now there's, you know, the up and down, up and down, up and down on those pavers, not good for wheelchair users. So not, you know, that we could have done a better choice there. In the middle, this is an enclosure that was designed for the pandemic. Um, they took an interesting tact of uh, putting sort of a intermediate level that goes up maybe, you know, less than two inches with a little ramp and then another one that goes up a, a few more inches. And that takes you up to the raised deck and, you know, hopefully to accessible seating. So that's, I thought that was an interesting and potentially usable uh, solution. Next slide, please. And here we see, you know, people are, again are building um, decks and places to have um, their, their dining outside their restaurant. Um, the one on the left shows a deck that's up against a curb of a sidewalk. Um, it's kind of a missed opportunity because it would have been really awesome if there wasn't that sort of vertical gap there. If the deck were the same height as the curb, it would have been a much, uh, much better uh, solution. And on the right, we see a deck that has no transition whatsoever. Thanks and that is, again, another missed opportunity. Karen, this is Sachin. Yeah. Sure. Could, could we have you pause for a moment? Um, we're going to try to switch the captioning from auto caption to the captioner. Um, if you mind taking a quick break. Edson, please let us know when you are connected. Okay, just a second. Yeah, we are good now. Thanks, Karen. Sorry about that. Sorry, everyone, for the issue with the captioning. I think we should be good now. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is a collection of photos that Deb um, put together from her uh, sort of neighborhood a historic neighborhood in, and um, she was saying that many of the restaurants in this neighborhood are um, in older buildings and they have stairs uh, to the, um, stairs to the restaurant. And I think uh, we all thought maybe that with, by moving dining outside, it might, there was a possibility that if that was made accessible, then um, folks would be able to uh, participate in the dining experience in a way that they hadn't before. Um, so we would like to have seen that that dining be accessible. So let's look at some of the solutions that she, she saw. Next slide, please. So um, here is, um, you'll see many times the dining was just placed on the street with no uh, transition down or up 
to any kind of a deck uh, or raised surface, you'll see um, there are uh, sort of like little booths created, which might be too small uh, to fit someone who is a wheelchair user. Um, and the choice of furnishings, again, you know, tables and chairs with legs that uh, don't provide knee and toe clearance. Um, next slide, please. And here are just more examples of uh, different options of, of dining along the sidewalk and um, the choices. You know, it's a narrow sidewalk and um, that there are obstructions along the sidewalk that make it even more challenging to, to get to these uh, dining areas. Next slide, please. So here, these, these options, um, you'll see on the left that they've raised the, the, air, the dining area um, up, put a little sort of fake grass on it and made the, the surfaces flush to the sidewalk. So that's awesome. And the same for the banquettes on the right. However, they didn't provide accessible seating. You know, there's, there's a picnic table there um, in the left-hand image, but there's a heater right at the end. So you, you can't even access the end. And of course, um, the banquettes um, are particularly uncomfortable for, uh, and don't include wheelchair users. Next slide, please. And, um, and here, um, again, you know, the outdoor dining did not get the memo about no high top tables. So <laughs> we're seeing, we're seeing the same, you know, uh, problems uh, in outside that we were seeing inside with the proliferation of high top tables. Next slide, please. So even though this isn't exactly perfect, this was a good example in Deb's book. Um, not only did they raise the surface that the tables are on, but the tables themselves um, have wide space legs so that it would certainly be possible given um, sort of wide enough placement to allow maneuvering space between those tables to allow a wheelchair user to, um, to join in on, on the dining fund. Next slide, please. So kind of the final thoughts, if you're, if you're gonna provide seating um, um, out, outside, um, like in the street, um, be sure that you raise the deck level with the sidewalk for easy access. Be sure that you pick accessible furniture for that dining area, and then provide an accessible route to the accessible seating. Great, next slide, please. And here are some pandemic, kind of very specific pandemic related uh, changes that we're seeing. These have to do with how to operate doors. So in, in my neck of the woods, I'm sure in yours, uh, we are seeing uh, a change from the standard uh, door actuator button that you have to press to the wave to open devices. So it's a no contact um, a way to open the door. They're also including these foot poles, which is the right-hand image. It's kind of an orange L-shaped thing. I'm not exactly sure, you know, I don't use my feet, so not exactly sure how you use them, but um, they are allowable um, as long as there is still a traditional door hardware, uh, door handles on the door. And um, people are using those to open the door. No contact, no hand contact, I should say. Next slide, please. We're also seeing some interesting trends in the change in service. So uh, I, I, I see a lot that um, there has been an effort to separate service people from their customers uh, quite a distance and, you know, six feet of separation. And that can be extremely challenging for people 
with disabilities who have reach limitations or size limitations in terms of being able to, um, to get the service that they've come for. And then of course the proliferation of QR codes to substitute for actual menus. Um, I find this um, challenging in a number of ways. Uh, for folks in the low vision and blindness community, how do they know that they're there? It's very important to identify for all your customers where that is and how to use it. Um, even if they can um, um, find it, then uh, we would want um, that they can, you know, be sure that they're getting uh, access to the menu just like everybody else. Now, on the plus side, I can imagine that if you can get a menu on your smartphone or your smart device, maybe it's possible that you can use your accommodations on your phone to, to you know, go through that menu. Maybe that's good, but I think it's really important that we are identifying for customers every customer that they're there. Next slide, please. And then the issue of social distancing really I think was quite discriminatory towards folks in the low vision and blindness community because so many of the guides and information that we used to identify social distancing were um, like unable to be detected. You know, a paint strip on the floor or a sticker on the back of the chairs. How does somebody know whether or not that's a, yes, I can sit there, no, I can't sit there, or even what, what it says? So I think it's really important that we think about providing information about social distancing and other health uh, requirements in multimodal uh, communication, like tactile, visual, audible, all together. Next slide, please. And you know that same with directional signage. Uh, I I know my grocery store is now all one way. You have to like go down one aisle in one direction and up another aisle in another direction. But how would somebody know that? You know, it's a sticker on the floor. Uh, so I think we really want to think about um, how to provide directional information again in a multi-sensory way. Next slide, please. We touched a little bit earlier on um, sinks or lavatories, as I call them, um, in, in toilet rooms um, as having all touchless features. I have to tell you how nice it is to, um, to not have people uh, splashing water or dripping water um, all over the countertop in an effort to uh, get to the paper towel. Um, you're, you're seeing here on the left, soap, faucet, and hand dryer all at the same fixture. I, I just think that's great. I've had way too many soggy elbows uh, from my, my adventures on wet counters. And then on the right, I really like the idea of uh, soap and uh, again, soap and automatic faucet. And I love the curved bowl because it gives a little bit lower space in the front edge uh, for those of us who are shorter. Next slide, please. And the pandemic has brought us partitions, right? Um, everything is divided off. And, and while that's for health benefits, uh, it can really hinder um, people with disabilities access to things. So those partitions that we're seeing on the left between each of the um, uh, exercise equipment, uh, you know, that might obstruct the clear floor space and the ability for someone to transfer onto a piece of um, exercise equipment. So care must be taken that that is not, uh, that the partitions do not obstruct the use of the machine. And the same goes for the partitions around the dining tables um, that we're seeing outdoors here. You know, somebody who uses a wheelchair is likely to have a bigger footprint than someone sitting in a traditional uh, armchair, and they may not be able to fit around those partitions. So thinking about those space 
considerations is really important. Next slide, please. And here we are at hand hygiene stations. Again, a very necessary and probably something that's gonna be with us forever, right? But where are we putting them? I think um, thinking about like, on the left, we have the image of like the hand sanitizer on a stick um, that's just floating in the middle of the lobby. How is someone going to find that? Um, is that at a correct mounting height? Or is it something that you're just going to trip over? Or on the lower right, we're seeing lots and lots of hand sanitizer stations just being stuck up on walls in corridors. And care needs to be taken that they are mounted in at an accessible height, that they are not protruding objects for someone who might be uh, shorelining along the wall, um, and that, that they are identifiable. So um, I think when you add these sort of kind of aftermarket, you might say, additions to your building, you really want to think carefully about how they're how and where they're mounted. Next slide, please. So let me, I have a conclusion and I, I need to find it. So I am hoping that um, today's session helps you to determine how to support accessibility in your design work, even when faced with the new design trends. They're, you know, not yet addressed in the standards. For each project and feature, ask yourself, who does this design exclude? We demonstrated some creative ideas today for how to make your buildings inclusive and welcoming to everyone, and some things to reconsider in the future. I hope you leave today with a stronger sense that beautiful accessible design is a social justice feature. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And that was just a wonderful presentation that brought great insight to some of the real challenges that um, persons with disabilities can face with these new um, architectural trends and some of the issues that the pandemic has brought forward that we might never have seen before. Um, we have a few questions um, that we have just a few minutes left for that if you have it, we'll go straight ahead into them here. Um, are there any accessibility concerns to be aware of with the touchless wave door opening systems? Have you seen any concern? Um, no, well, I think, I think that the touchless wave to open include more people than the button pushing, because it allows for a much smaller um, uh, movement and force. Does it include everybody? Probably not, because I'm sure there are some individuals in the disability community that don't have the ability to move an upper body uh, uh, feature. Um, so it's not 100%, but I think it's definitely better than the push, uh, push button. I agree too, and I'm seeing it more and more. Um, I like that opportunity to be able to just get near it. And like you said, someone that doesn't have uh, the full motion in their shoulders or uh, elbows and arms, it can make or break the opportunity to participate or come into that facility. Um, so I'm, I'm in 100% uh, uh, agree that the, the easier that we can make it for people to enter our facilities, the better. Along that line, can I just add that one sure. thing that I've seen um, experimenting with is the idea of including a wave to open with a touchpad below it so that folks who don't can't access the wave to open can um, sort of bump up against a lower touchpad using their chair. So I think that's kind of a, it's a combination item, but it might, uh, like even broaden the number of people who are included. We had a couple of uh, statements and questions that came in. Um, uh, not really a question here, or, or is it a wouldn't the foot pull 
not be compliant with the standard about not having obstruction within 10 inches of the bottom of the push side of the door. Well, I, I think the foot thing is only on the pull side. That's correct. And that's the way they're installed. Is it? Yeah, they are. The pull side? There's an interesting one here, though, that um, if you have it on the pull side, sometimes may prevent the door from opening in the full 90, 90 degree position, which that could be an issue if you only had the minimum clear opening space and weren't able to get your door in that 90 degree position. So that might be something if you're backing into a wall or, or something that uh, doesn't allow it to go beyond that, that pull, you might consider. Yeah, absolutely. Good call. Yeah, I'm, I've not seen that addressed before. Um, let's see here. We have another one that uh, asks, do you have uh, some examples of a reasonable accommodation that can be made to provide cues to social distancing that are accessible to persons with low vision or vision impairments? What would be some of your ideas? Uh, well, I think you could potentially make those distance bars more tactile. So you could, if you were going to install them permanently, have uh, make them thickened in some way. So they might be detectable by white cane, maybe. Um, I think um, providing, uh, you know, you could do the, the, the separation maybe doesn't need to be on the floor. Maybe if you want to have some kind of a, um, uh, what do you call those? Um, sort of the rope lines, um, maybe you could space those in such a way that uh, when you have a pedestal, that's, you know, you're every six feet, and then someone walking along could, um, you know, find those with their cane. I, I have not seen any good solutions. I'm like, literally, that's an off the cuff answer. How about um, living in the Northwest? Do you have any guidance for electric vehicle charging stations? That seems to be pretty right. prolific everywhere now. Oh, they are. And um, I would, I, I think right now, California has probably the most robust uh, guidance on um, how to make uh, electric vehicle charging stations accessible. Um, we, uh, here, here in Washington, we're we're still working on that. We, <laughs> but um, I think that we're seeing um, changes in the types of vehicles that are available uh, to be um, modified, um, and uh, of course, people with disabilities drive any number of vehicles. So uh, we certainly want to ensure that you can drive any car that you like and and get gas <laughs> or power, I guess. <laughs> and, and we're seeing more and more electric vehicles that are providing oh. accessible features and including vans. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We, we have a, a comment here that says access challenges persist in airports and on aircraft. What can architect, architecture teach us about air transportation that is inclusive to everyone? Um. Well, that is a really good example. You know, it's all design, right? So you're designing, you're designing, whether you're designing a building or an aircraft or, or the aircraft lavatory um, or the seats. Um, I think thinking about the range of people who are, are included, that would be kind of the first step. Um, I think it's particularly challenging in, in, in aircraft um, because of the, um, Sort of the economic component uh, is, is a little bit more stressful than in buildings, uh, but certainly we just need to broaden our understanding of the fact that we're designing for people, all people, and people come in different bodies, lots of us. Well said. Do you have any last thoughts here before we end our session for today? No, I just thank you all very much for um like soldiering through with all the all the tech and my paper and my you know like things not going quite right but um I, it's been a pleasure talking to you all and i'm i just i encourage you to you know do the best you guys have the power uh to to make us all feel more welcome so uh use that it'd be great
Thank you. And that is all the time we have for our program today. And I know we'd all like to thank our presenter, Karen Breitmeyer, for taking the time to be with us and for her flexibility in, in this presentation. And I'd also like to thank our board member, Deb Ryan, who helped us prepare this presentation. And thank you to everyone who joined us to learn about accessible design and designing for inclusion. As Karen indicated earlier, we all have a role to play in ensuring equity of access for persons with disabilities. If you are a design professional or someone with a question about accessible design, please feel free to reach out to us here at the Access Board for technical assistance. We're available five days a week, Monday through Friday, to answer your accessible design questions by phone and by email. And our contact information is now on your screen and it is 1-800-872-2253 by voice and 800-993-2822-TTY. And our email where you can receive a written response to your questions is ta at access-board.gov and all the resources you can imagine that'll help you better understand the issues that we're talking about today. The minimum requirements can be found at our website. This recording will also be placed on our website in the coming days. And I just wanted to tell people that um, CEUs were not available um, for this session. Again, our website is www.access-board.gov. I hope you'll join me in thanking Karen and thank you for joining us in today's presentation. This concludes today's program.